Section 1. You will hear part of a conversation between an art auctioneer and their client. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Good afternoon, madam. Ah, yes, I see you successfully bid for lot 2374. Good afternoon. Yes, that's correct. I hope you are satisfied with your purchase. If I may say so myself, I think you got a real bargain. What you paid is not much above the original reserve price of £300. I love P.J. Browning's work, and to be honest, I was prepared to pay a lot more. I'd decided beforehand that £500 would be my limit, so getting it £150 cheaper than I was prepared to pay for it was a wonderful surprise. I have to say that 17th century paintings of rural English scenes like this one are rather underrated. The art world seems to want abstract paintings by modern artists more. Geometric designs seem to be the trend today. Not my taste at all. I have a more conservative taste when it comes to art. The painting will blend in with my antique furniture at home. Well, I hope you have a big wall to put it on. Luckily, I'm very fortunate to live in a rather large country house. What are the exact measurements of the painting, by the way? The width is 1.5 metres, and the height is 1 metre. Without the frame, that is. If you include the gilt-covered frame, which is quite large to balance the size of the painting, you can add on another 0 0.5 metres for the width, and the same again for the height, obviously. That shouldn't prove too much of a problem. I'm just happy I managed to win the bid for this wonderful painting. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. So, madam, I would just like to take down some details from you. OK, go ahead. I recognise your face as you've attended several of our auctions before, but I can't put a name to your face. Could you remind me of your name, please? Oh, yes. It's Mrs. Bradwell Thompson. It's a double barreled surname, so you need a hyphen in between the two surnames, you see. So that's spelt B-R-A-D-W-E-L-L, -L, followed by a hyphen, then T-H-O-M-S-O-N. Well, the first part's right, but you spell Thompson with a P in between the M and the S of the surname. OK. And your address, please. Yes, it's Charlton Manor, that's spelt C-H-A-R-L-T-O-N, and I live in Kingston Village. Oh, and of course, you'll need the postcode too. It's K-N-2-6-5-6-T. Sorry, did you say K-M-2-6-5-6-T? No, it's K-N, not an M, then 2656T. Well, thank you, Mrs. Bradwell Thompson. I think that's just about everything. Oh, and I need to know when you would like the painting delivered. We deliver on Tuesdays and Fridays, the week following an auction. Well, I'm having a long weekend break in the Cotswolds, a charming area of England, you know, so... This coming Friday would be impossible. How about next Tuesday? No problem at all, madam. So that'll be the 23rd of March. Superb. Thank you. 
Not at all, madam. It was a pleasure doing business with you. That's the end of section one. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear the curator of an art museum talking to a group of visitors who are visiting the museum for the first time. First, you will have time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. A very good afternoon to you all, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad you've chosen to visit the prestigious Triton Museum of Art today and I'll look forward to showing you around. But first I would just like you to refer to the maps of the museum that you picked up on your way in. Now... Where you picked up your maps is just to the left, as you enter the building outside the museum store. By the way, the store is a great place to pick up some souvenirs before you leave. Oh, and if anyone wants to leave a coat in the cloakroom, then please feel free to do so at no extra charge. It's just over there on the other side of the entrance to the museum store. OK, so this nice spacious area we're now standing in is the Rotunda. It contains some of the museum's most striking sculptures. From here, you gain access to all the museum. Leading off from the Rotunda are the Warburton Gallery and our other large gallery that houses a permanent art collection. We'll be starting our tour actually in the Permanent Collection Gallery, as it's the nearest of the two galleries to the entrance. We'll make our way afterwards to the other gallery I mentioned, as it's right next door. Oh, the smaller room behind the Warburton Gallery that you see on your maps is just a storage space for the museum, and access is blocked off to the public by a railing across the entrance to that area. So now, where were we? Ah, yes. After we visited those galleries, which will take us a good hour, as there are so many interesting exhibits to see, we'll make our way back across the rotunda and visit the cowl room. It's right at the far end of the museum, on the opposite side of the rotunda to the Warburton and Permanent Collection Galleries. It's one of the museum highlights, and contains some high-quality contemporary art exhibits. Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot to point out the ladies and gents' toilets earlier. They're just before you get to the cowl room and are adjacent to the museum's store. Don't go into the room opposite the toilets. That's our staff room area and kitchen. <laughs> right, so that's all you need to know for the moment. Let's begin the tour. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Well, I hope you all found the tour interesting. If any of you would like to become a patron of the museum, you can request information from the museum store. Being a patron entitles you to special discounts on visiting exhibitions and first refusal on tickets to special events. 
You will also be the first to know about our museum events as you are automatically placed on the museum's mailing list. You can choose to become a gold, silver or bronze patron of the museum. Gold patrons are also permitted free entry for one accompanying guest. However, all patrons can receive year-round benefits that are not enjoyed by non-patrons. Having said all that, I would now like to announce some very special news. Next year will be our centenary celebrations. It's hard to believe it, but the museum was founded over a hundred years ago. Accordingly, we will be seeing in the new year in style with a special masked ball. This has been organised in response to a special request from some of our patrons. Plans have yet to be finalised for this one-off event, but a themed masked ball has been suggested. The idea being that guests come in the guise of famous artists, past or present. One exciting event that has been confirmed is the Summer Garden Party. We are anticipating a lot of interest for this one, so it's best to book well in advance. Whilst the tickets are by no means cheap, we like to think that the price reflects the quality of the event. Amongst the many treats we have in store for you is a live orchestra playing in the museum's gardens, which are to the back of the main building. It is weather permitting, of course. Again, we are dependent on good weather in order for the barbecue to take place. Alternatively, a sit-down meal will be provided in the cowl room. Everything from the entertainment to the food is included in the ticket price, so there are no hidden extras. Now, having given you a round-up of the highlights of next year's social events, let's go on to the artistic highlights of next month. Coming up shortly is Ewan Bailey's newest installation, Light and Sound Waves. Always thought-provoking, his previous installations have been very well received. We will also have Hamish Barnes here for the first time as artist-in-residence. He will be encouraging visitors to adopt a more hands-on approach to art. Finally, last but not least, we will be exhibiting the work of Sean Long, who will be making his artistic debut. His work will be on show in the Warburton Gallery over the summer period. We are anticipating a large attendance at his exhibition. Well, that's all from me. I look forward to seeing you at one or maybe all of our events. It's certainly going to be an action-packed year for the museum, both culturally and socially. That's the end of section two. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section th Now turn to section 3 Section 3 You will hear part of a televised question and answer session between a celebrated art critic and three members of the public following a talk on outsider art First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25 Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. I think I've said enough, so now it's the turn of the audience. Would anyone like to start the ball rolling and comment on anything I said earlier in my talk? Ah, that young gentleman over there. Hi, um, my name's Jake and I've got a question for you. You referred to outsider art as being the work of self-taught rather than trained or professional artists. Uh, does that mean anyone can produce art, then? Well, what we define as art will always remain subjective, 
But given that we can agree more or less on a common perception of what is actually art, then yes, anyone in theory can produce art. The challenge, though, is to produce good art. Excuse me, may I ask a question, please? Yes, of course. Would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. My name's Lucy. So, Lucy, what would you like to ask? Don't you think that untrained artists lack the necessary technique to produce good art? I felt that some of the paintings by outsider artists that you showed us earlier were, to be honest, rather crude. I think you're confusing technique with art here. A great technique doesn't guarantee great art, you know. But I think impressive art can still be produced by gifted artists lacking in what are accepted as basic art skills. OK. Can I have another question from a member of the audience, please? Hi, I've got a question. Oh, my name's Dave, by the way. I just wanted to ask how many outsider artists were or are recognised in their lifetime? Relatively few. The exceptions are the ones who create particularly monumental or significant works of art, like uh, Nekshan's sculpture garden in India or Ferdinand Cheval's fantastic building, The Palace Ideal. Both, as you know, were created purely from recycled materials. Yeah, they were pretty amazing. I remember them from the slides you showed earlier. But what impresses people most is not so much the sheer scale of these buildings and sculptures as the work involved. These artists built their work single-handedly over many years and, more to the point, in total secret as they lacked planning permission. That adds to the romance of the whole undertaking, don't you think? Well, their work certainly impressed me. Yes, outsider art certainly produces work that is one of a kind. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So, now I would like to post some questions to the audience. First, I would like to ask someone from the audience which, out of all the outsider artwork I showed you previously, is the most impressive and why. Excuse me, may I? Oh, yes. Hello again, Jake. So tell me, which artwork was your favourite? Well, funnily enough, the paintings by Adolf Wolfi. I know the perspective is crazy and all over the place, but the work is so detailed. Well, look at the great artists like Picasso and Matisse. Perspective or lack of it was never an issue with them. Oddly, whilst I appreciate that style in outsider art, I can't say the same for modern art. I guess it's because I don't approach the two art forms with the same set of expectations. Interesting. You mean you expect more of artists with obvious skill and a professional training, like Picasso and Matisse? I guess so. You know, I expect modern artists to use conventions like perspective, at least. And another thing, I can't really understand why modern artists are often so highly acclaimed by critics, whilst outsider artists are virtually ignored. That's probably because they are generally not as skillful, I suppose. I take your point. I imagine that, with the exception of outsider artists, you tend to like work by more traditional artists. I suppose. Like everyone, I can appreciate Renaissance art, as exemplified by Da Vinci and Michelangelo. Amazing technique and all that. And I also understand the popularity of Impressionist artists, too. One other question. What's your opinion of modern sculpture? Do you have the same opinion of modern sculpture as you do of modern painting? I think all sculptors have to be pretty skilled to work with materials like metal and stone, so I admire them in a way. But many modern sculptures, particularly public artworks, are often given praise I feel they don't deserve. Hmm. You seem to have quite definite views about art. <laughs> well, it was most interesting hearing your views. That's the end of section three. You have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of an art lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I have just shown you all some slides of a very varied set of paintings. I noticed, as I was showing the slides, a few giggles in the audience and a few looks of dismay. I guess entitling my lecture Unconventional Art Geniuses was a bit misleading. When most of you were looking at the frankly basic colour use and rather primitive painting techniques, you probably were more than a little surprised. Well, I have a shock for you all. What I'm about to tell you next will help you understand the title of my lecture. All the slides I showed you previously are of artworks made by, wait for it, animals. Yes, I heard a few gasps in the audience when I said that. Whilst the artwork would be definitely primitive by human standards, when you consider that the artworks were executed by animals, then, well, they are frankly staggering. Nor were the artworks purely the work of our closest relatives, the apes. No, they were produced by animal artists drawn from a diverse pool of species, ranging from elephants to gorillas, birds and even sloths. In fact, in recognition of this, last year London's Grant Museum of Zoology staged what organisers thought was the first interspecies show of paintings by animals. In the show, art was shown from an orangutan, a gorilla and an elephant. Whilst the gorilla and the orangutan produced works that bore a resemblance to the paintings of modern artists de Kooning and Klein, the elephant's work took a more figurative approach in the rendering of a flower pot. Now, before you all go thinking this is a revolutionary discovery, I would like to put the record straight. The contribution animals can make to the art world was highlighted as far back as the 1950s. In this decade, Desmond Morris, celebrated social anthropologist and author of bestsellers such as Body Watching and The Naked Ape, introduced Congo, the painting chimp, to the British public in a TV appearance. Back then, animal art makers were regarded as little more than a novelty. Today, however, Animal artists are not viewed so much as novelties, but as sophisticated creators with skills and senses that they use to execute artworks in ways humans never can. As a result of animals being taken more seriously as creators of art, it has become commonplace today for zoos to provide materials to captive animals. The hope is that by giving animals the means to create art, they will be kept physically and mentally stimulated. Obviously you can't give a lizard a paintbrush and expect it to draw. What the zookeepers do, though, is to give animals species-appropriate art materials and tools. For example, sloth bears, who feed by blowing away dirt from the forest floor to feed on termites, have been given a straw-like apparatus to blow paint onto a canvas. What is one of the most interesting discoveries to come out of all this, though, is the finding that animals voluntarily and instinctively participate in the creation of art. It seems therefore that animals derive as much pleasure as humans do in applying paint to canvas or making a clay or plasticine figure. The obvious conclusion to draw from all this is that there are more similarities between man and other animals than some of us might care to admit. However, just to satisfy the sceptics amongst you, there is something I would like to add. So far, the primate and elephant art that has been produced 
often bears an uncanny resemblance to Western art. The certain conventions are evident in the animal's art that suggests a degree of human intervention. As proof of this, an elephant named Boon Me was actually guided by a keeper who steered the animal's trunk to paint brush strokes on a canvas. Nevertheless, we should keep an open mind about animal art, as there are just as many examples of artworks that have been completed by animals without human aid. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.